Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop, where today I'm going to build this six-draw double dresser. I'll be using more of my antique pine, but what's unusual about this piece is that it's very narrow, which means that it'll fit in just about any size bedroom. It's also useful as a sideboard. It's fun to build, and I'll show you that next, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Boy, there's some beautiful views of the valley from up on this porch that leads into a guest bedroom. This house belongs to some friends of mine, and they've been gracious enough to allow me to come in and show you this double bureau. What I like about it are the proportions. It's long, yet it's not too deep. Now, if I was to build this piece, I don't think I'd be as aggressive showing the joints between the boards on the top. And I think I'd reduce this breadboard edge. But there are some features I like. I like this recessed panel on the ends. And I like the size of the drawers. They're a little under three feet wide, about seven and a half inches deep. And the draw front has this nice band that goes around the edge and some nicely turned wooden knobs. Now, if we were to build this piece from some of our recycled antique pine, we'd have a beautiful piece and one that's very useful. Well, after studying the dresser in Napa, I made a few design changes and built this prototype. Now, instead of using three or four boards for the top with a V-groove at the joints, I made a smooth top using just a couple boards. I did narrow down the breadboard edge, but the thing I kept was the depth, 18 inches. And that's the thing most people notice about this piece. And they feel that they could use it in other rooms, like the kitchen or the dining room. Now, I built the piece from antique pine, boards like this, that I used to throw away when I did renovation projects, but not anymore. Take out any nails, run them through the planer, and you have beautiful pine like this. Now, I make no attempt to conceal all the defects. Leave some of the nail holes, and leave the worm holes. In fact, the more worm holes, the better. Now, if you'd like to build this dresser, a measure drawing is available with the materials list, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, let me show you how this dresser is built. Each draw is made from plywood with a groove in the edge that rides on some hardwood runners. Now, basically, this is a frame clad with old pine. There are draw frames, or what we call dust panels, made out of plywood with hardboard panels. And the panel keeps dust from going from one draw to the other. Also, these panels add a lot of strength to the piece, keeping it from racking. And you often see this in quality pieces of furniture. Also, there are vertical panels, one on each end and one in the center. And that's what I want to get started with today. The frames are made up of 3 quarter inch plywood, and I'm going to join them together with biscuits. And that's the perfect joint for this type of application. First thing I want to do is make the biscuit slots. But before we use any power tools, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now, in addition to the adhesive quality of the glue, because it's water-based, it causes the biscuit to swell, making a very strong joint. And now a little clamp pressure for about 20 minutes, depending on what the temperature is. Now here are some of the plywood pieces that I'm going to use to make the dust panels. And I need to mill a quarter inch groove centered on the edge of each piece a half inch deep. So I've set up my stack dado head cutter with just the blades, no chipper, and that gives me the quarter inch that I need. 
Now here's a tip. Even though I've spent quite a bit of time setting up the dado to have the groove perfectly centered, if I rotate the piece so that the opposite face is against the fence, it'll guarantee that it's centered. Now to assemble the dust frame, I first put some glue on the tenon and in the groove. Now the hardboard panel just gets slipped in the groove with no glue. The last frame that I have to make is right under the top. It runs from the vertical end frame to end frame. It's made out of plywood and assembled with biscuits, but no hardboard panels. The top will take care of the dust. The dust frames are joined to the end and center panels by a dado joint. To make those dados, I've increased the width of the dado head cutter to three quarters of an inch and adjusted the height for a quarter inch depth. I'll just carefully guide each panel against the rip fence. Now for the center frame, I run a dado on both sides. Now this rabbit and one at the other end will enclose the end frames. Let's put it together. Well, a little bit of glue in the dados, and then I can slip the panel in place, hold it flush, and secure it with some four penny finish nails. Now for the dust panels for the other half of the dresser. And to secure those, I'm actually going to have to toenail into the center frame. And now for the top frame. I've put a bead of glue on the back of all the frame pieces, and this is probably the most important part of the frame, this piece of eighth inch masonite. And once that is nailed on, this will not rack in any way. Here's some pieces of old pine that I've roughed out for the end panels. These long, narrow strips will be the styles. These shorter pieces will be the rails. And these pieces will become the panels. The next thing I want to do is plane them so that they're uniform in thickness. After running the pieces through the surface planer and the joiner, I now want to glue them together to make a panel. And since they're too thin for biscuits, I'll depend just on the glue. <laughs> to join the rails and styles and support the panel for the ends of the bureau, I'm using the same methods I use to make the dust frames. Well, 
Well, here I'm putting the finishing touches on the draw runners. These will actually support the draws. And they can be made out of any hardwood. To install the draw runners, I'm going to use a gauge block. It's a scrap piece of plywood, and that will ensure that the runners will be the same height off the dust frame. With the rails glued to one of the styles, I can now slip in the panel, which of course has no glue. And then we'll put on the other style. It's looking pretty good. All right, looks good. A couple clamps and we'll set it aside to dry. Oh, hi, good morning. I got started today by taking the side panels out of the clamps, they dried overnight, and I cut some biscuit slots along the front edge so that I could install the style of the face frame. And the reason I'm using biscuits is because I want as few nails to show as possible in the finished product. Well, we'll set these aside to dry and glue up some more of those old boards for the top. Well, now after a couple passes through my six inch joiner, I have a joint that will hardly show. We'll cut some biscuit slots and glue it together. All right, we'll set this aside to dry and start working on the base. Now the base is made up of a flat board with a decorative cutout and then a molding on top. The molding appears to be one piece, but it's really two pieces. A piece of stock that's been beveled at a 20 degree angle and rounded at the bottom, and a small piece of cove molding that sits on top. I'm gonna to start by making the beveled piece. Now I've set my saw at a 20 degree angle and I'm gonna run some 3 quarter inch square stock through. To smooth out the saw marks on that piece, I'm gonna use my joiner. I've tipped the fence 20 degrees, and the trick here is to keep the stock flat and to keep your fingers away from the knife, so a good push stick comes in handy. To round over the bottom corner, I'm gonna use my router shaper table which I've set up with a quarter inch radius round over bit. To make the cove portion of the molding, I've switched to a one half inch cove bit. I'll mill the cove in the edge, and then I'll rip it to the correct size of the table saw. Well, now let's turn back to the carcass, and I'm gonna put the end panels on first. I'll just clamp them in position and secure them with some screws from the inside. I suppose a faster way to attach these face frame pieces would be to just use nails, but I kind of hate to see nails on the face frame. These biscuits work great. Okay, that takes care of the face frame. Now let's finish up the base. Mitered corners, eventually reinforced with glue and a biscuit, but let's make the decorative cutouts on the bottom at the bandsaw.
Well, there's part one of that molding. A couple passes with the block plane will round over the first piece just a little bit more. Yeah, that dresses it up. A traditional way to finish off a top is with a breadboard edge. And what this edge does is it covers up the end grain of the field and it provides some stiffness to prevent the top from cupping. To make the joint, you need a tongue on the field and a groove in the breadboard edge. Now, I didn't want the tongue to show through, so what I'm going to make is a blind mortise and tenon joint. The first thing I want to do is make the tenon on the field. What I'm doing here is removing a little bit of the tongue so that the breadboard edge will cover it. Well, now I'm starting to form the groove in the breadboard edge. I'm using a quarter inch radius straight cutting bit. Now, it'll take two passes to get to the correct depth because of the size of the bit and the amount of wood I'm removing. Now, I want to plunge the piece in right at the edge of this forward fence, and I want to remove the piece when I reach the edge of this trailing fence. Now, to make sure that the groove is centered, I run it first on this side, and then the opposite face against the rift fence. The same technique I used earlier on the frame. Now, to install the breadboard edge, I don't want to use any glue because this is a cross-grain situation. And if I apply glue and the field of the top wants to shrink in a drier season, it may split. So what I'm going to do is just set the breadboard edges and clamp them in place and secure them with some hardwood pins. This way, the top can still move freely with seasonal changes. I'm easing the ends and the front edge of the top with a portion of a quarter inch radius round over bit. I use these holes to secure the top. And note that I've elongated the hole so that the top will be able to move freely with changes in humidity. Well, now for the draws. It's just a plywood box with an old pine front. The first thing I want to do is make a dado in the side pieces to receive the back. Now with the dado head reduced to one quarter inch in width, I can make a groove in the sides and the front for the plywood bottom. The sides of the drawer are joined to the front with half-blind dovetails. To make those dovetails, I'm going to use a dovetailing jig and my router, which is set up with a collar and a dovetailing bit. I'm set up to make the tails first. After reconfiguring the jig and installing the draw front on the top of the jig, up against the stop block, I reset the fingers and mill the tails. With all these glue surfaces and the shape of the dovetail, you have an incredibly strong joint. back is next.
this is the groove that those oak draw runners will ride in. Now here's a draw that's completely finished except for the knobs. I applied a three quarter inch pine board to the draw box and then wrapped it with this little decorative strip. Let me show you how I go about doing that. I take the draw box and slide it in the opening. And then I want to make sure it's centered on my runners. Same gap on each side. And then I use some 3 16 inch shims as spacers. I'll take my draw front, rest it on the shims, just lean it out a little bit so I can put on a dab of hot glue, and hold it in place until the glue sets up. And that assures me that the draw front is perfectly centered in the opening. Now some one inch screws in pre-drilled holes will attach the front permanently. Now let me show you how I make the trim pieces. I start out with some 7 8 inch wide, 1 8 inch thick pine. And I just take my block plane and knock down the corners. And then take some sandpaper and round it over. Now here's a tip. When I miter very thin pieces, I install a backer block. And that'll keep the ends from splintering out when I run the saw through. Okay, a little bit of glue and some brads. Ah, that dresses it up. Now for the knobs. I use a hardboard template to locate the holes. It's easier than measuring for each one. We couldn't find any pine knobs at our usual sources, so we turned to a friend, Peter McGuire, from the Boston Turning Works. And, no pun intended, they turned out beautiful. All right. Now, to protect my antique pine, I first applied two coats of a very old finish. It's called orange shellac. It's an alcohol-based material that dries very quickly, sealing the wood, and giving it this nice orange color. Now, after doing one more sanding, I'm hand applying with a rag a thin coat of water-based satin polyurethane. And what this does is seals everything and gives it a nice, soft luster. And that's all there is to that. Well, how many of these do you think you're going to build? One, two? All you need is a little bit of antique pine in your scrap plywood pile. I got to order for at least two over at my house.